John chapter 7, look at verse 1. He says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, which is, means Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brother therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, again for the day. Thank you for your assembly, which you have brought us together to worship you, to fellowship, to learn from your word, to be directed in our lives, how we should live, to bring you glory. Father, as we look into this message, Father, may your truth be clear. Father, as you know that this is just a mortal tongue and a sinful heart that is bringing the truth of life. Father, we pray your power upon your words, upon the ears that it may penetrate their hearts. And we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in verses 1 to 24, we may or may not get through the 24 verses, but there are three different types of unbelief which we see. We see a variety of ways that you can not believe the Lord. Now, in verse 1, as we get started, to put us into context, he says, after these things, well, the things which he mentioned in John chapter 6, the sermon which he gave that I am the bread of life, Jesus walked in Galilee. He remained in Galilee because that's where he had fed them. That's where he had ministered and given the sermon. But he remained there for he would not walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. It was not a matter of Jesus was afraid to go, uh, but he was it was not his time yet. He is still living his life after the timetable of God. Now, one of the interesting things in verse 2, it says, Now the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. That places us about six months. John gives us a six-month gap between the chapter 6 account, which if you look, this was at Pentecost, or not Pentecost, but at Passover. And now we have the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was observed in around September, October. And the Feast of Passover was observed in the spring. So John does not set out. His purpose isn't to give us a, a biography, a day-by-day -day account of Jesus. We know that John's account is to show the reader that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and he is the Messiah. And so he does not set out to give us, a, uh, he does not set out to fill in the gaps. Now we know from the other gospels what was going on in these six months. But one of the, the things that should not be lost on us is between, in these six months in between, most of the time Jesus is spending discipling his disciples. He spends it alone. I mean, only two days is he in the company of thousands as he fed them with the loaves and the fishes. And there was at least 5,000 men. So if you do the math, some estimate it was 20,000 people. There was only two days of that, but six months with private discipleship. And that's what the church is to be. And we see even Paul charge Timothy, teach faithful men that they may teach others. And we see God has preserved his church ever since he started his church with the same way of we disciple, that you come under the discipleship of him and then that you go and you teach the next generation and the next generation teaches the next generation. How important. We should not lose the significance of that. You know, I heard somebody say, I think it was John MacArthur, said your greatest churches are not your biggest attenders, 
It's your most discipled. Those are your greatest churches, are the ones that, who are the most discipled. So wanted to bring that up, that here we are at the Feast of Tabernacles, and that this is not some ordinary feast. It's one of the major three feasts of the Jews. Actually, if you were a Jewish male, you were required to go to this one of these three feasts. This was the most popular one. This was a, a celebration. You know, they would put up booths. It was also called the Feast of Booths. And they would set up booths and put straws, you know, on, on, on their roof. And then they would celebrate all week. It was a seven-day celebration. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews that would flock to Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. So because it was a Jewish male requirement, his brothers just assume Jesus is going to go. In verse 3, his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. So his brothers are persuading him. Now, these, these I know it says brethren in the KJV, but these are his brothers. These are his half-brothers. Uh, the, his half-brothers were James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, or Jude. Now, we know that his, at least two of his, one of his brothers is an apostle, James, and then two of these brothers went on to write a New Testament book. So we know, despite what verse 5 says, that it says, neither did his brethren believe in him, we know that even if they did not at this present time, they go on certainly to believe in him. And if not all of them, it was certainly at the resurrection, at his crucifixion, we see that his brothers go and wait in the upper room, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So uh, even if it's not now in this time slice, which we see uh, that they believed in him, that they do. They eventually do. And that should be an encouragement to some of us having maybe family members that do not believe how it's, and though we pray and sometimes we worry and we toss and, and it grieves us, and, but be encouraged that the Lord will save his. The Lord will save his sheep. Uh, Jesus says that he will save all and there will be none that is lost. All that the Father gives to him that he will not cast away, all, none will be lost. Now their request to Jesus in verse 3 is go, Jesus, go to Judea, go to this flock of thousands of people that thy d disciples, which we know we have defined that word previously, it doesn't necessarily mean his 12 apostles, but disciples simply means followers. We see many lost followers. We see many that were in the crowd that he preached to that who are called disciples that did not believe in him. So Disciples simply means those who were following Jesus. He had followers in both Galilee and Judea. He had them everywhere. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret. We read that, but verse 5, verse 5 is a bit of a shocking statement. You know, we are reading, we're, we're, we're yeah, okay, we get it. We, we understand and, you know, as I was praying about this message, I pray that the Lord teaches all our hearts of this type of unbelief. How did they not believe him? Because look at verse 5, it says, for, because. So something they said previously, John says, oh, they said that because they don't believe. Well, what would they say? How did they not believe him? Notice the words in verse 4. Now this is a very sneaky, deceitful unbelief that comes upon so many. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh. What's the desire here? What does the heart really want? 
Seek it to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. So here is Jesus' half-brothers, and this is a very family-oriented, hey, Jesus, why don't you go do your miracles? Look at all of these thousands of people. Look at all of them. And go and demonstrate your power. Go and demonstrate how extraordinary you are. Nobody needs to do these secrets or these miracles and secrets. What are they doing? They're saying, Jesus, if I were you, this is what I would do. If I had your power, I would go and I would show everybody. I would show it openly. I would go on the tour around the world so that they could look at you and marvel at you and praise you for that. And not only you, but how great would it be for the family? How great would it be for the brothers to have a brother who goes and does these amazing miracles? Their hearts were, Lord, or brother, <laughs> go seek to be praised by what you do. Go seek to be looked at to be gawked at, to be gazed at, to be wondered by. This is teaching us about unbelief. I don't think, you know, John had slipped in this, this verse and it kind of throws us off guard. How did his brothers not believe in him? I mean, they, they were raised in the same house with Jesus for 30 years. And like I said, they go on to believe. But right now, what are they doing? They're seeking their own, aren't they? They're not seeking the will of God. What does Jesus seek? Jesus seeks the will of God. For this cause have I come. That's what Jesus tells us. They believed the miracles of Jesus. They believed who he said he was. They were amazed by Jesus. They were astonished at Jesus' power. He was a spectacle to behold, and he had gotten everybody's attention. Look at this man, even his brothers. They believed on him, but what did they have? They had what's called a believing unbelief. A believing unbelief. Why? Because of their hearts. Oh, you read the words of Jesus and how it grips our hearts, how we examine our own hearts. They're, they're not really in belief. They're not looking through the shell. They're not looking deep into the teaching of what Jesus came to do. Jesus didn't come to be here. I remember earlier that the people tried to set him up as a king and he fled. Away. Jesus was not coming for the fanfare. He wasn't coming for popularity, coming for fame. He could have, and if that was his objective, he could have done it a lot better than what he did. He could have came down as the king, and everybody bowed down to him. I mean, so he wasn't coming for the fanfare. And he's looking at them. Look at verse 6. What gives us further proof of this? Then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you. Oh, what an indictment. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. What's he in essence saying? He's saying, in other words, the world cannot hate you because you are motivated in your heart by the very thing the world lives for. Praise. Recognition. Applause. Awards. For people to look at me. You know, some people, they'll walk into a beautiful cathedral and say, now, this is believing. They have to believe with their eyes. 
you know, uh, we see this before in, in, at the end of John chapter 2 where he did all those miracles and then it says that they believed on his name. But Jesus knew what was in the heart of man, and Jesus did not commit himself to them. You've heard of the saying that faith is believing without seeing. Well, believing unbelief is believing only because you're seeing. A lot of people that call themselves Christians don't believe until they've walked in and they see the beauty of a golden cathedral or this or that, the lavish. And then they're like, oh, seeing this, I believe. I believe who he is. But they really don't believe. They don't have the heart that Jesus has. They don't want the will of God in their life for them at all. They leave that place. They leave thinking, well, that's where Jesus is. And if I want to go back, then I, I know where to go. They don't understand. So that's the heart that believes him, believes his word, believes who he was, but there's still an unbelief. Verse 5, that's an indictment. Neither did his brethren believe in him because of that, because of their hearts for him to be sought openly in praise. They have a self-seeking heart of praise. But in verse 7 was the indictment. That, look, you're acting as if, the, you're acting as the world. The world will recognize the desire you have for recognition, the desire you have for him to go and be a spectacle and for fame and for reputation. And they will not feel indicted by you. So this is another reason that we know in verse 7. Now, in, in later on, Jesus actually to his disciples, the ones who believe, he does say, the world hates you. So the difference is, we know these are unbelievers because Jesus says the world does not hate you. But to believers, later on, John chapter 15, I, be I believe, let me, let me figure that out. Yeah, John chapter 15, uh, verse 9, he says, if, actually, this, we're in John, go ahead and flip there over with me. John chapter 15, verse 9, he says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Have I, am I in the right place? Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 18. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Well, that's a different speech that Jesus is giving versus our verse 7 in chapter 7, isn't it? There's a distinction between those who believe and those who do not. Those who believe, they love him. They seek his commandments. And they are... In your life, you will indict them. You will indict the world. If you're acting like the world, the world won't hate you, is basically what it's saying. So this is another indicator. Actually, James, even later, and if you read James, he'll say friendship with the world is enmity with God. You think James got this lesson by the Lord right here? I think he did. And it's such a sneaky, deceitful unbelief that we need to be taught. Why did his brothers not believe him? They loved him. They're his half-brothers. They were cheering him on. And don't, I definitely cheer my family members on. I want the Lord to bless my family members. I want them to have success. But at the same time, here Jesus is going about his ministry and they are trying to say, well, why don't you just do it for the popularity and the fame? Isn't that a self-seeking promotion? But Jesus isn't about self-seeking. He's about God-seeking. He seeks the will of God. That is the will which Jesus does. He says in, in chapter 5, verse 30, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me. In 541, he says, I receive not honor from man. In chapter 6, verse 38, he says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that has sent me. 
over and over and over, Jesus says, make the will of God your number one. Your number one. You seek God's glory, not your own. You seek God's will, not your own. Even Jesus' prayer in chapter 17, verse 4, he says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And at the cross, he said, it is finished. The will of God for him is finished. Now, the application is let us, our exam let us examine our own hearts that we don't only believe in Jesus because we will receive the praise from others. You've got a lot of people who profess to be believers and they're charismatic. I'm not anti-charismatic people, not the religion, but the personality. I'm not anti-charismatic type of people, but some people you can tell they failed to be popular and praised in the secular world. So they're thinking, why don't I give the church a shot? That's the heart that seeks to be praised. That's the heart. May we always be careful that that's not our motive, that that's not what we are here for, is to be praised. A heart that knows Jesus is great and he can do all things, but it's a, a heart that says it's about my endurance and my recognition for my Christian sacrifice. But let's put on the humility of Christ. Let's put on the deeper message which he's giving to them. It's not the outer shell of fanfare, but it's the deep-rooted message of turning from your sins and trusting in him, believing upon him, asking him to forgive your sins and your wickedness and your stubbornness and the proudful hearts that we have. We don't want to release the, our honor and badges. We, we have a heart that wants to hold on to those, but a heart of humility seeks to do the pleasure of God in their life. And we're going to see that here a little bit more. But I pray that you do not have Believing unbelief. I pray that you have believing belief. That's coming to him in a heart that's broken, a fear of judgment, and that you're clinging on to the cross for salvation. In 737, Jesus says, If any man thirst, let him come and let him drink. So we see, well, let's, let's keep going. My, my clock up here is blinking. So I'm sorry if time gets away from me. I'm, 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 off, the, I'm off the clock. So, <laughs> all right. So verse 8, go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. That's interesting. He told his brothers that he has, is not going up. But he says in verse 10, but not openly, but as it were in secret. So Jesus did go up to the feast, but Jesus did not go up to the feast in which the way his brothers wanted him to go up into the feast. He didn't go up as, as a grand display and, and, and grand miracles, but how does Jesus go up? It says he goes up in secret, and then what does he do once he gets there? In verse 11, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he is a good man. Others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So Jesus didn't go up to do grand miracles. He goes up to teach in the temple. In verse 15, and the Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man letters? What that means, it's, it's an idiom, the Jewish idiom, it's holy letters. They often refer to the scripture as holy letters. How does this man know letters, having never been learned? Look at this. So we see the marvel. Once again, it's not the miracles they're marveling at. It's his teaching. It's Jesus' authority. Well, of course he knows the scriptures. He wrote them. 
For the Holy Spirit wrote all the scriptures. He knows that they, they testify of him. Could you imagine sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning the scriptures? Wouldn't that be just, wow. I mean, that, that, that would, I mean, wow. They marveled. They were stargazing. They were transfixed on his teaching and his preaching. But where were their hearts? How did they have unbelief? Well, verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will. There it is. I wanted to get to this earlier because the whole message is about doing his will. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, in verse 17, we see what is his will. Well, he answers in verse 18. He that speaketh of him self, he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory, that's the will of God, is his glory. He that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Wow. Take the negative of that statement. Who are, who are the wicked people? Who are the wicked ones? Who are the ones that do not have righteousness within them? Who are the ones who are false? The ones seeking their own glory. The ones seeking their own glory also, in verse 17, you take the transit of property, you take this logic all the way into verse 17. What does this also mean? If you are not seeking the will of God, you do not know God. If you are not seeking for the glory of God, you do not know God. You do not know his word. Because Jesus says, had you known God, remember earlier, he said, had you had the love of God in you, you would have believed me because Moses wrote of me. Remember, read the scriptures with the passion for the will of God, not your own. How many teachers, how many preachers, how many polished preachers get up and it's just all about them? It's all about, you know, hey, look at me. They're self-promoting. They're self-exalting. Even when they study the word, they are figuring out how it can promote them. They don't have a motive of promoting, uh, promoting God. And not just preachers and teachers, but all of those who read the word of God. What this tells me is before I pick up the Bible, I needed to surrender my heart to what God wants. What do you want, Lord? What do you want? Is it, is it my will or is it thy will? Is it my will for my life or is it your will? Is it my will for my job and my marriage and my family and my home? Is it my will? There are all these my decisions or are they your will? You have a heart that seeks God and the will of God. Then go to his word and you will know. And that's what it says. You, will, you know God and you can approach his word. And you will read the things of God. He'll teach you from the word of God. That's what Jesus says. I'm not up here. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching. These aren't my words, even though they you know, technically were. But in Jesus' humanity, he's teaching us a lesson. That even there's the heart, the believing unbelievers. I believe that he can preach. Boy, he can preach fire and let's go brag on him. They marveled at his teaching. Let, let's go brag on this teacher and preacher and just his greatness. And then, the boy, you're just eating it up. You're starting to believe your own press, right? And, and you're starting to want those compliments and want it and be swelled about it. And then even your, your messages are all about how can I bring attention to myself and my education and my intellect and my funniness and my stories and, and things of that nature. And it's all been askewed. Verse 18, he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him the same is true. And no one righteous to send him. So not only do we as God's people we look through the shell. What's their, what are they really saying? 
Are they really promoting the glory of God? Or are they promoting themselves? And then we take that judgment and put it on the inside. Am I doing the same thing? Am I here because of the spectacle, the marvel, because what everything it's because I'm being served, how I'm being served, are people watching me? No. If you do that, you're not true. And the last part, let's read, did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keep it the law? He now he moves to the next heart. Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil, who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto him, I have done one work, and ye all marveled. What's he talking about? He's talking about when he was in Jerusalem before at the pool of Bethesda. He raised that uh, lame man after 38 years on the Sabbath day. He healed them. And ever since that day, the Jews have sought to kill him. That's the reason he didn't want to go down there in Judea and make a big public demonstration. His time had, you know, time had not come yet. I did this one work in verse 21, and y'all marvel. Moses, therefore, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, and are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? And here is the big indicator. This is hanging over the, all of it like a banner. Verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. What was the common thread between these three types of unbelief? We see that there was a heart that wanted human praise. A heart that wanted human praise in all three of these types of unbelief. They did not seek the will of God. They do not seek the humility that comes with surrendering yourself to the will of God and to your life. The root of their unbelief were all the same. Sin at its root, I like this definition, I think it was C.D. Cole, is competition with God for sovereignty. That's what sin is. Sin is competition with God for sovereignty and for praise. That's what sin is. Is that continually in your heart? Then you are in unbelief. Do you really seek the will of God? Do you really seek Him, His glory in your life? We mess up. We sin. We fall short. But the Lord convicts us and brings us back to the reality that life's about Him. And He gives us life. He gives us eternal life. Oh, what a, what, I mean, this life right now, it's hard to think about because people don't want to think about it. I know I don't want to think about how short a time period I have. It could end any day. It could end any second. I, nobody wants to think about that. I mean, nobody wants to think about the bill that's due. They just want to keep pushing it down. Well, I don't have to worry about that today. I'll just worry about it tomorrow. I don't have to worry about that today. I'll just worry about it tomorrow. And then it comes due. One of these days, it is appointed unto you to die. But after this, the judgment. And then you walk into eternity. Have you been living the life that you just want to live? Not thinking about God, not thinking about his law, his holiness, his purpose for you? I pray that you do not settle and have a false hope that you are a believer you really have a believing unbelief. His brothers believed him, but they didn't have a believing heart. They didn't have a committed heart. They didn't have a surrendered heart. The, the Lord was not their Lord in their life. For the brothers, the miracles of Jesus could get them praise. For the scholars, the miracles of Jesus could flatter others with praise. For these angry Jews, the miracles of Jesus threatened their own human praise. The Jews were about the law, about performance from the law and receiving human praise. 
Well, I hope you can say with me and with the, the Apostle John, as he says in chapter 1, that we have beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I pray the Lord has brought your heart to a proper place of conviction, of seeing him, worshiping him, being thankful to him for his grace, understanding just what God did to save your soul, to redeem you by his blood, that he loved you and that he died for your sins, that you will not perish. Or well, have you come to him in complete trust and faith, asking him to forgive you, being pricked in your hearts for your sins? I pray the Lord has blessed you, and if he has spoken to your heart in any way, we certainly invite you to come. We don't have long invitations. Brother Richard and Sister Harriet, if you would come up, and we will have a song of invitation. We'll just sing a couple of